In this video, we're going to show an example of interactive programming taken from Chapter 2 of How to Design Programs using the Big Bang function. The simplest form of Big Bang takes four arguments. The first is the initial state of the clock. The second is what to do to that state on each tick of the simulation or animation. In this case, we're going to subtract one every time through. The last in this example is when to finish, when to end the animation or simulation, the interactive program. In this case, it's going to be when the state of the clock is zero. And then in the middle in this example is what to do, what to draw at each clock tick. So we're going to start at 100. Each time through, we're going to subtract one. We're going to end when we get to zero. And each time through, we're going to call some function render, which this is built into Dr. Racket. This is built into Dr. Racket. Render, we have to provide. So let's have a look at what that might look like. So we're going to have Big Bang, 100 on tick, sub 1, to draw, render, and stop when 0. And if we try to run this, we're going to get an error. It says, Big Bang, this function is not defined. Oh, that's because we need to include the universe. So require to H how to design programs universe. Run again. Now, Big Bang is defined because it's coming from the universe. What we're running into is it says render. This variable is not defined. So sub 1 was okay because that's built in, 0 is okay, but render doesn't exist. So we have to write render, and we're going to start with just something very simple, render. And the function that you write here is going to be handed one argument, which is the current state of the clock, whatever that is. So we're going to call that t for time, and we're just going to draw out a string in a little text box. So number to string here converts the time to a string. Text gives us a little text box that displays this string in this font size in that color. And so render should be called over and over again with 100, then 99, then 98, then 97, down to 0 for t. So we should get to see basically a little countdown clock. So we're going to run this, and hopefully we'll see a little countdown. And we don't. And that's because text is also not defined, and that's in the image pack. Require to HTTP image run. Now, this is a little less obvious. The, com the complaint is that render is used here before its definition. And the problem is actually up here, render's being called but it hasn't been defined yet. So I don't know why Dr. Racket raises the issue here uh, at the definition when the real issue is up here. Um, and so the fix though is to put the definition of render that we have up above the Big Bang call. And now when Big Bang gets down to render, it'll know, oh, you mean that render, and everything should be good. So now hopefully we'll get our countdown and we do! So we get a little tiny window, and it counted down from 100 to 0 in red in 12 point. And so that's a simple example of using Big Bang to do something not terribly exciting. Now, we can use this to do all kinds of things. We could rewrite the rocket animation, for example, using Big Bang. Um, in this case, actually what I'm going to do is show an example of using parametric equations. And over here we have the Wikipedia entry on parametric equations, which can be used to generate really quite amazing diagrams, which we're not going to worry about. Instead, we're going to focus on the parametric equation for the circle. So you probably learned in algebra somewhere, or geometry, that uh, the equation for the circle was x squared plus y squared equals 1. Uh, an alternative formulation, the parametric formulation, is that it's all points of the form cosine t comma sine t where t goes between 0 and 2 pi. 
well, this is really cool because t is like the parameter that we're getting in our render function. And so we can draw a circle at this position, cosine t, sine t, and we should be able to get a point that moves around a circle over time. So we'll animate a point moving in a circular motion. So I'm going to leave my render that I had here, and I'm going to make a new function, define trace circle. And for trace circle, I want to place an image on a scene. So this will be a little more like the rocket example uh, that we looked at er earlier. And I'm going to place a circle that's got radius 5, that's solid and say green. I mean these colors and sizes are fairly arbitrary. And I need to place it at some position x, y. We'll fill that in a second. And then it's going to place in an empty scene uh, at a hundred that's a hundred by a hundred. So that's the basic idea I want. Ooh, trace circle should take an argument t. I left that out um, because the thing we put in to draw, which is going to be trace circle here, is going to be handed an argument t. And this t is what we're going to use to generate our x and y coordinates. And so as we saw in the Wikipedia entry, the x is going to be cosine of t and the y is going to be sine of t. So let's just put that in. Say x is cosine of t and y is sine of t. So if we get lucky, this should trace a circle that to draw we'll call trace circle with t going from 100 to 99 down to 0 and those values of t will give us different positions on the circle. So now that we have trace circle placing an image, a solid green circle of radius 5 at position cosine t sine t in an empty scene. Let's run this and see what it does. And we get a little green circle up in the corner, but it doesn't, just wiggles a little bit, and it certainly didn't seem to like trace a circle. Well, there's a couple of things that are is at issue here. One is, if we think about cosine t and sine t, those have values between negative 1 and positive 1. And this scene is 100 by 100. So the circle is moving in a very, very little area. Um, and to really see it, it would be nice if we were our radius was something more like 50 or 80 instead of a radius of 1, which is what we're getting right now. So let's actually multiply cosine t and sine t by, let's say, 50 to pick a number. And that should make the arc of the circle, the radius of the circle, large enough that hopefully we can see what's going on. So let's try that. And now we are actually tracing a circle, but we're doing it super fast. It's jumping around so quickly that we can't really see what's happening. And the issue there is t, cosine and sine and racket, uh, take their argument in radians, not in degrees. Uh, so a full circle is going to be 2 pi radians, which is about 6 and change. So we go from 100 down to 0, so we go through many, many, many circles, uh, and we jump large distances when we move from one point to the next point on the circle. So to make that slow down, to reduce the distance that we travel, we want to actually divide t by something like 10, say. And that will mean that the angle that we move from one time step to the next, instead of being one, will be one-tenth. And that will give us, hopefully, something that looks a little more like tracing a circle. So run. And look. Oh, that's looking pretty good. Now, we don't see it for three-quarters of the circle, because only a quarter of the circle is in our scene because we're rotating around 0, 0. That's the center of our circle. So we see it as it passes through here, but we don't see it as it goes around the outside edge. We'll run it again. And there it, whoop, and then it goes around and whoop, again. So to make it so that we can see the circle more, we want to move the center from 0, 0 in to the middle of the scene. So if we add 50 
to both the X and the Y, that'll push the center into the middle of the scene. So we'll add 50, and we'll add 50, and now with a little lock, that'll actually put the center in the center of our scene, the center of the circle that we're tracing in the center of our scene. And there we go. We are tracing a circle, and the center of the circle is in the middle of the scene. We're coming out a bit on the edge, which suggests that our radius of 50 is now probably a little large. So if we change this to something a bit more like, say, 40, and we say run, now we are tracing a very nice little circle. Okay. And if we wanted to see it go around longer, we could go from a, like a 1,000 down to 0 or 200 down to zero, and then we get to see our circle go around more and more. So, this use of parametric equations allows us to trace a circle uh, quite nicely. We had to do a fair amount of modification uh, to get the circle to be viewable in the space that we were doing it in, but once we got that all worked out, um, which we were able to do sort of incrementally, um, we were able to get a very nice circle. Our final example, we're going to look at another parametric equation, this time for what's called the cardioid. Um, and this is the Wikipedia entry for the cardioid. And the cardioid makes this sort of vaguely heart-shaped, hence its name, uh, shape. And it has a nice parametric equation, which is that x is a times 2 cosine t minus cosine 2t, and y is a... 2 sine t minus sine 2t. Now, again, we have to manipulate uh, the radius and the position, and rather than walking through all of that, I'm going to just paste in uh, the finished product. And so I've got a function trace cardioid t, which in this case does a red circle of radius 5. And here we have minus 2 times cosine t over 10 uh, minus cosine 2 times t over 10, and this is 2 times sine t over 10 minus two, sine of 2t over 10, which is essentially the cardioid formula from Wikipedia. We've again divided by 10, and we've done some uh, multiplying and adding uh, to move, to make the cardioid bigger and move it into the middle of the square of the scene that we're doing. So we're going to run that. Oh, actually, we have to change trace circle here to trace cardioid, and now when we run that, we see that we get, oops, let's actually make that run a little longer so that we can uh, see what's going on a little more. So it looks like a circle in this area, but then it comes in and then back out again uh, in, again, sort of a heart-shaped pattern. And so we can get some fairly sophisticated things to happen by using the Big Bang function with appropriately chosen uh, parametric equations in the case of um, the animations that we're doing here. But you, there's no reason you couldn't use Big Bang to do something much simpler like move a rocket up or down um, like we've done in some of the earlier examples. The Big Bang function can do a lot more than we're showing here. If you look at the documentation for Big Bang, Big Bang, uh, Big Bang can, uh, you can provide functions that say what to do when a key is pressed on the keyboard, what to do if the mouse is clicked, um, and uh, a number of other things like that. So you can build more interactive programs where the user can control the behavior of the program by typing on the keyboard or clicking the mouse. Uh, and then you start moving into sort of real, full-on graphical uh, programs with you know menus and buttons and all of that sort of stuff. So that's all we're going to do for now. Thank you very much. Talk to you later.